Well, thank you for inviting me to this uh, debate today. I'm glad to be here. James and I have tussled about this topic for many years, as some of you probably know. Um, we've had many debates together, and I, I always enjoy debating uh, Dr. White. And I want to thank you for your presentation, Dr. White. Um, with that presentation, I'm tempted to uh, actually skip my opening remarks because uh, I have so many things I'd like to say about what Dr. White presented to you, but I, I will try to save that for my rebuttal. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is give you um, my version of the topic today, 20 minutes. Uh, what I want to do, first of all, is say what this debate is not about. Uh, I don't think this debate is about predestination per se, even though that's the title of it, since we both believe in predestination. The doctrines of predestination did not start with John Calvin. They started with Jesus, Paul, the fathers of the church, and were confirmed at the Council of Orange of the Catholic Church by Pope St. Felix III in 529 AD, specifically condemning the semi-Pelagians who believed that free will was not a product of or prompted by God's grace. Canon 3 of the Council of Orange says, if anyone says that the grace of God can be bestowed by human invocation, but that the grace itself does not bring it to pass that it be invoked by us, let him be anathema. Canon 4 of Orange says this, if anyone contends that in order that we may be cleansed from sin, God waits for our good will, but does not acknowledge that even the wish to be purged is produced in us through the infusion and operation of the Holy Spirit, he opposes the Holy Spirit, let him be anathema. These canons from the Council of Orange are more or less repeated a thousand years later at the Council of Trent in 1563, another Catholic council. So what is the difference between Calvin's brand of predestination and the Catholic Church's? Calvin follows a long line of teachings that sought to make predestination absolute, that is, without including man's free will or even the grace to prompt the free will. The first to do so was Lucidus in the 5th century, then Gottschalk in the 9th century, then Wycliffe in the 14th century, then Luther and Calvin and Jensen and Zwingli in the 16th century. Common to all these views was denial, the denial of a free will of man to accept or reject God, while the church still held on to the doctrines of predestination. Incidentally, Martin Luther was excommunicated from the Catholic Church not because he taught about adult, against indulgences, but because he taught absolute predestination, that predestination did not include the free will of man to accept or reject God. This debate, as all the others fought about the subject in the last 2,000 years, boils down to one issue, that is, in conjunction with predestination, does man have a free will to accept or reject God? If man does have a free will, it denies the T of tulip, total depravity, since total depravity claims man had no free will to choose for God after Adam sinned. It denies the U of tulip, since the free will of man makes Calvin's unconditional election conditional on whether man uses his free will to choose for God. It denies the L of tulip, since free will opens salvation up to anyone in the world who chooses for God, not just a limited few that God selects arbitrarily. It denies the eye of tulip, since free will allows man to resist God's grace and choose not to be saved. It denies the P of tulip, since the free will of man allows him to fall away from God's grace if he so chooses to do. So this debate is about whether the Bible teaches that man after Adam has a free will to accept or reject God for salvation, a free will that works in conjunction with predestination, not against it, not a free will that works against predestination. Why? Because the Bible teaches both, that's why. The Bible teaches both predestination and free will. And it all leads back to the essence of who God is, which is very complicated and hard to understand and is virtually incomprehensible. Is God free or determined? Is he a unity or a diversity? 
Is he one or many? Is he moved or unmoved? These are all questions philosophers and theologians have struggled with for thousands of years. Or are all of these divergent categories some way all in God that we don't understand? Well, I'm here to tell you that predestination and free will work together. We may not understand how they do, but the Bible insists that they do. Dr. White believes predestination can, indeed, work with man's free will because he believes Adam, before he sinned, had a free will to accept or reject God, even though God obviously had the salvation program predestined before Adam made his choice. What this debate is not about, this debate is not about making it appear that those who believe in free will think that it is because of something special in them, that they chose God or that they were better or smarter than other people who didn't choose for God. It is simply about obeying God by using the power of grace that God gives us to decide to obey God by avoiding sin and helping others to do the same. If not, then the same I think I'm special argument can be used against the Calvinist, since he thinks God picked him to be saved over the rest of the human race, and that nothing he does here on earth, no matter how heinous his sin, could ever jeopardize his election. This debate is not about a personal view of predestination versus an impersonal view, wherein the personal view claims that because it sees God as choosing people, whereas the impersonal view sees him choosing only a plan of salvation. No, the correct view of predestination is both individual and universal. That is, God picks each person individually, and he also decrees the universal plan and execution of how his choosing will be manifested. The main difference between me and Dr. White, however, is that Dr. White believes God does the choosing without regard to man's free will. This debate is not about monergism versus synergism, one of Dr. White's favorite ways of characterizing his opponents, since the word synergism usually carries with it the picture of a hodgepodge of ideas all mixed together. This debate is about whether man has a free will to accept or reject God, period. If you want to talk about synergistic ideas, one only need look at the details of Calvinism itself. There are supralapsarians, infralapsarians, intralapsarians, those who believe in the permissive will or the secret will or the revered will, or the general call versus the special call, or the general election versus the special election. On and on and on the distinctions go. And this is what happens when you don't have the truth. You begin to make distinctions ad infinitum to cover your tracks. This debate is not about theopocentric versus anthropocentric views of salvation, although Dr. White has often cast the debate in those terms, to give the impression that his view is about God and what he desires, whereas his opponent's view is about man who ignores what God desires. No, the view that is theopocentric, if we want to use that term, is only the correct view, not the view that says that any participation of man's free will and salvation somehow taints the purity of either God or salvation. If the view that says only God determines and man's free will has no participation in salvation is not correct, is not in scripture, then it doesn't matter how we may advertise it as theopocentric. It is either anthropocentric or possibly even diablopocentric. If God himself commands that man participate in salvation by exercising his free will to accept or reject God, then any view of salvation that excludes man's free will is heretical, pure, and simple. And thus it is not honoring God in the slightest, but dishonoring him. I submit to you that it is also a dishonor to God by the way in which Dr. White and fellow Reformed theologians defend their view of absolute predestination. When they say that God elects certain people to salvation because he wants to display his merciful qualities, but he decides to bypass others and judge them for their sins because he wants to display his justice against evil. This is a highly insecure and arbitrary God, is he not? What kind of God would choose to save some and allow others to remain damned just to show how merciful and just he is? Doesn't he already know how merciful and just he is? Why does he need to decide to save some purely from an arbitrary decision since all of them are equally guilty for their sins? 
just to show that he's just. This is not the God of Scripture, a God who needs human beings to prove who he is. No, the God of Scripture damns humans because the humans refuse to use their free will that God gave them to accept God for who he is. And then God has no choice but to damn them because he is just. Since the debate is about whether the Bible teaches whether a man has a free will in accepting or rejecting Christ, let's look at some of those passages. There are passages that teach that God wants to save all men. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Greek for all men here is pothanthropos and literally means all men. This is supported by the context in verse 1 which tells us to pray for all men. Paul says, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. And this is the same Greek word, pos anthropos. Now notice it doesn't say, I want you to pray for all kinds of men. He says, I want you to pray for all men. And why would we not pray for all men? Do we select individuals whom we want to pray for? Are we going to determine who's worthy of our prayers and who is not? This whole thing is also supported in verse 6 of the same passage, which says, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Wherein the words for all are the Greek huper ponton, and refer to all the people in view with no limitation. Or are we going to say that Christ did not die for all people? And here is where Calvinism has a severe problem, since the only way they can fit all men into their belief of absolute predestination with no free will is to say that all men does not mean all men in the world, but only those who are predestined. So Dr. White and John Calvin would retranslate 1 Timothy 2.4 in the Calvinistic paraphrased Bible to say, God desires all kinds of men to be saved. In other words, the God of Calvinism doesn't want all men to be saved. He doesn't want them to repent of their sins. And he really doesn't want them to stop their evil because God intends on using their evil to glorify himself when he judges them at the end of time. By the same token, Dr. White and John Calvin would also have a severe problem with verses 6 reference to Christ being the ransom for all, since their theology says that Christ is only a ransom for a limited few, hence a limited atonement. In spite of what Paul explicitly teaches, Dr. White is forced to say that Christ cannot be a ransom for all, because Dr. White believes in his view of absolute predestination without free will, that Christ neither wanted to save all men nor became a ransom for all men, and did this precisely because he wanted to display how just he was. Tell me, how fair and just is it to arbitrarily bypass saving the rest of the needy human race when it is no more work to save them than it is for the ones already saved. We would call a man who had the power to save all the people from a sinking ship quite a monster if he arbitrarily decided to save only a small portion of them and deliberately allowed the majority to drown simply because he wanted to show he had the power to be merciful to some but not merciful to others. Who would want to live with such a capricious, self-centered, and unfeeling being? And that's why Martin Luther said, yes, it takes a great amount of faith to believe that God chooses some and damns others for reasons only he knows and nothing to do with what the man has done. Wouldn't God get the same or possibly even more glory if he saved the whole human race rather than just a small portion of it? If we want to be logical here, On Dr. White's homepage of his website, in bold letters, his banner says, the gospel is ours to proclaim, not to edit. But that's exactly what he does with 1 Timothy 2.4. He edits it by injecting the word kinds to make it say, God desires to save all kinds of men so that it fits with his preconceived theology. Dr. White is fond of taking passages that speak of predestination at face value and in meticulous literal detail. But when it comes to passages that speak about free will or God's desire to save all men, suddenly Dr. White refuses to take those passages at face value. 
and seeks to add or take away words or concepts so that they fit into his preconceived theology about God's sovereignty or theopocentric salvation or all kinds of words that he uses. But the Catholic Church says no. We interpret each scripture at face value and do not try to force it into a preconceived idea. That's why paragraph 600 of the Catholic Catechism says this. To God, all moments of time are present in their immediacy. When, therefore, he establishes his eternal plan of predestination, he includes in it each person's free response to his grace. That's why I came back to the Roman Catholic Church after being a Protestant for 18 years. Because I saw, I saw that the Roman Catholic Church was the only church that would look at all of the scripture and not choose a set of scriptures to overwhelm another set of scriptures, but try to balance all of the scriptures to give one solid truth. So when the Catholic Church reads 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6, or even 1 John 2, verse 1, which says Christ is a propitiation, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, we take it literally and hold that Christ did propitiate God for the sins of the whole world, just as the passage says. And so apparently when Paul in Ephesians 1.11 said these words, also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, the counsel of God includes the free will of man and how man will use it, both before Adam and after Adam. It can work no other way. Otherwise, we divest scripture of all the passages that say each man has the power to accept or reject God by the mere invitation that God gives him. There are other passages that talk about free will as well. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. John 5, 39 says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. And as a matter of fact, this verse I just read prefaces the, chapter in verse, or the uh, verses in chapter 6 in which Jesus says, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. Well, previous to that, Jesus had already told us that they were the ones who refused. That's why God was not going to give them to Jesus, obviously. Of course, we can isolate that from chapter 5, but that's not how we are to exegete Scripture. And the last passage I'll give you is 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 10 to 13. Paul says, For this reason I endure all things, for the sake of those who are chosen. Those are the predestined, the elect. I do, that, I do these things for their sake, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. But notice the caveat. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So here we have Paul talking about the very elect. And yet he says about those very elect, if we deny him, he will also deny us. So we see how the Bible consistently joins the elect, the predestined, and never opposes that to man's free will. Never are they made mutually exclusive. They are always joined together. And it takes careful exegesis to do that. And let's hope that we can do that the remainder of this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. St.